first book, Conversations with God, was such a phenomenal success. What do you think it was about that book that was so irresistible for people? I think people saw themselves there. I think that people realized that what they found in that book was what they had been thinking in their minds and hearts. Not everyone, of course, but, but many people felt that. Uh, and others felt that they had found an explanation of God and a description of God that they could agree with, and maybe for the first time in their lives. I recall vividly one person in particular, one lady, who came up to me maybe four or five months after the book was released at a speaking engagement. And she said uh, after my talk, thank you for introducing me to a God I could fall in love with. And I think that really captured for me the essence of what happened in that book, in that people found a God they could love again, and not a God they had to be afraid of or worried about or wonder whether it was even there or real, but a God they could really love, a kind of a God that, that they could think of as their best friend, rather than this overbearing parental figure that they had to appease and make sure that they didn't offend. What a beautiful gift to give to people. I mean, God, one of the things that strikes me about, I guess, my understanding of God and, and how it's changed from reading your work and looking at other bits and pieces, that, you know, over the years. Um, it's such a loaded word, it's such a loaded term for so many people and depending on who you ask, what religion they come from, one gr what group they're associated with, you know, what individual kind of cultural scenario they've grown up with, the, diff the understandings of what that three-letter word means is so vastly different. And I was hoping you could Tell me what happened that night that God first spoke to you in that audible voice and what your understanding of God is these days. Who or what is God to you these days? It's not a question of who or what God is, but who or what God is not. Because to try to define God and to try to answer your question, who or what is God, is almost impossible, since there's nothing that is not God. It's much easier to answer the question, who is God not? And the answer is nothing. Nothing that exists is not a part of that which we call God. That, so nothing in reality, nothing in physical reality, or even for that matter, metaphysical reality, is not a part of what I call God. Nothing stands outside of God. So the answer is that God is everything. Many of the world's religions speak in those terms. They speak of God as the all in all, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, you know, the unseen the seer, the unmoved mover. They, ought, they try to find some phrase that can grapple with the enormity of what we would call God. So that's uh, who and what God is to me, everything really. Well, what happened that night is really described in the book. It's in, in the first book, it's described pretty clearly there. I simply uh, had reached a point in my life where I was no longer happy with how things were going, and uh, I, I didn't understand why life was showing up the way it was, and I didn't know what I had to do to make life work anymore. And, and I, I really uh, wrote out an angry letter on a yellow legal pad that happened to be in, on the coffee table in front of me. I woke up in the middle of the night, very angry, just threw the covers back, I, restless and couldn't sleep. It was quarter after four, 20 after four in the morning. And, and I thought, gosh, you know, what does it take to make life work? And what have I done to deserve a life of such continuing struggle? And I sat there on the coffee table and I just wrote out I don't know what I thought I was doing. I just wrote out the questions, just ready to get it out of my system more than anything. But then I, you know, I heard that voice over my right shoulder that said, do you really want answers to all these questions or are you just venting? I turned around, of course, there was no one there. And uh, I, I thought, my God, I, I know I heard somebody there. There was 
And then I realized either I'm going out of my mind, which was entirely possible, <laughs> or, uh, you know, or something extraordinary has just happened here. So then I wrote on my yellow legal pad, just on a whim, you know, yes, well, I, I am venting, but, <laughs> but if you've got answers to these questions, I'd sure like to know what they are. And immediately, like a download, as if someone had just downloaded a large amount of information in my mind, everything that's in the first part of that book came to me right there. And I began writing you know, incredibly fast to try to capture all of it, but I was, I want to say, receiving. Before I knew it, I realized that I was involved in a, an on-paper dialogue that was uh, just proceeding back and forth. But about uh, 50 or 60 pages into it, handwritten pages, it said, this will one day become a book. So there was a definite sense that this information that you were receiving was not coming from, it wasn't coming from a distant memory or a... No, no, because, and I'll tell you why I knew that, because nothing that I was hearing was part of my previous understanding of anything. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one example. It said, somewhere in the early part of our exchange, it said, there's no such thing as the Ten Commandments. That was so far removed from my upbringing, from my, you know, spiritual awareness, what I presumed to be my spiritual awareness. It was so far removed from my cultural understanding uh, that I, uh, it, such a thought was almost, almost blasphemy. And there were many other thoughts like that, not quite that edgy, but still so, so, so totally outside of my personal cosmology, my personal understanding of things, that I, I didn't know what, you know, where's this coming from? You know, it's, it's my understanding that there are four basic or fundamental, fundamental principles that kind of underlie the majority of the conversations with God work. And that is that we're all one, number one, that there is enough, that there's nothing that we need to do, and that it's not a better way, it's just a different way. And of, and of understanding everything. And I'm particularly interested in the third one, actually, you know, because I've got so many people in my life that I know would love to chuck it all in tomorrow and walk away from their boss, give them the bird, <laughs> you know, but the reason that they don't is that they've got bills to pay and they've got mouths to feed and families to support. So I'm just, I'm interested in, in how you explain that third fundamental principle to, to people that are, uh, you know, are right in the thick of the daily grind at the moment. The statement, there's nothing we have to do, does not mean there's nothing we will do or might choose to do. It means there's nothing we're required to do. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is thinking that the, the things they're doing, that they're required to do them, when in fact they're making a free choice to do that. There are plenty of people who don't work. There are people who actually abandon their families rather than work. They're so unhappy you know, in their life that they just chuck it all and walk away from it. So uh, the, the problem with humanity is we keep on making a series of free choices and then we call ourselves the victims of our own choices. So what I say to people in my audience is, if you don't want to go to work and support your family, then don't. Who's making you do that? Who told you you had to do that? Oh, I just can't walk away, why not? People do it all the time. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, I'm saying that when you do what you claim to be the right thing of your own free choice, and then you claim your, yourself to be the victim of doing the right thing, then you're disowning your own self. You're disowning your own choices. For heaven's sake, if you're gonna do what you think is right, at least be proud of it. Don't, don't, don't let yourself talk yourself into that you're the victim of it. <laughs> what does that say about you if you're the victim of it? What does that say about you? You know, well, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only supporting my family and paying my bills and doing what's right because I have no choice? <laughs> what does that say about you? No, 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 of course you have choice. There's no such thing as, a, as no choice. So I say to people, let's understand that what this statement means, there's nothing you have to do, there's nothing we have to do, is God's way of telling us, it's another, it's a, it's another way of saying you have free choice always about everything. But for goodness sake, stop making free choices and calling yourself the victim of them. Wake up. Notice what's happening. Every act is an act of self-definition. Everything we do defines who we are. But we shouldn't, you know, do all these wonderful things that define who we are and then fail to lay claim to them, reject them, call them not our own. 
So, you know, that's, that's what's meant by there's nothing you have to do. There is nothing you have to do. It's about making free choice wisely and then owning it and taking responsibility for it and being the creator. Even if you make free choice unwisely. That, <laughs> I've made some Still unwise. <laughs> of, of course, exactly. Yeah. I've made some unwise free choices and at least stand up for it and say, okay, I made a mistake there. I won't do that again, but it, don't make yourself the victim. There's not conversations with God says there are no victims and there are no villains. There are only people who think they are. There's the, the seven key questions that you ask people to consider and consider it from a place that's really, you know, the deeper part of their soul where they're, they're, they're accessing something that's about a better world, a better, a better vision for society. The first one made such, like, crystal clear, incredible, logical and intuitive sense to me when I read it. Like, how can seven, almost seven billion people on the face of this planet all want exactly the same thing, to feel love, to be happy, to be secure, to be, you know, live in harmony. To have opportunity, to, 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 have, a, to have a fair chance, a fair shot, to, to feel equal in, in, the, uh, you know, in the business of life itself. And not be able to achieve it. Yeah, to feel safe and secure. Not only is it interesting to consider it in the, in the context of contemporary times, how can seven billion people all be after the same thing and be unable to get it? But think of it this way, we've been trying to do this now for several thousand years. Not, not several thousand months, but several thousand years. Now you would think that if a group of people who call themselves an evolving species, if not to say already highly evolved, were all after the same goal, for thousands and thousands of years, we'd finally be able to get there. So how is it possible that we're not able to do that? It's mind-blowing when you ask that question. And I've never thought about it like that way, but as soon as I read it, I was like, that is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Yes, if we were scientists in a laboratory, we would have, we would have said long ago, obviously there's something we don't understand here. Yeah. The understanding of which would change everything. I'd like to see the Pope stand up at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and just say from his balcony, with all due respect to the Pope, because he's a wonderful man, but why not ask the world's people, how is it possible for all of us to say we want the same thing and be unable to get it? What do you think the answer is? Oh, the answer is obvious. We're, we, we can't get it because what we want is the wrong thing. You, you, can't get, you, if, you can't get to the top of Mount Everest if you're deep sea diving. So, you, so if you try to do one thing but doing another, Obviously, you can't accomplish it. So the reason that we can't accomplish what we say we want is that we, what we say we want is the wrong thing. We're after the wrong thing. If we truly understood the real reason and purpose of life, we would be wanting and yearning for and seeking to achieve what we came here to achieve while we came to the planet to begin with. That is what, what human life is all about. And what we don't understand is if we did that, if we just retrained our focus, to what it is we really were designed to achieve, all the rest would fall in on us without effort. All the things we think we want, peace, health, safety, security, opportunity, love, joy, all the rest, would automatically show up in our lives without, without any effort on our part. Somebody, by the way, much more eloquent than I, put that very simply. Don't go around asking, what are we to eat? What are we to drink? Wherewithal will we clothe ourselves? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all else will be added unto you. We were placed on this planet. Human life is an expression of the universal essence that seeks to know itself in its own experience. That is, the purpose of life is for us to recreate ourselves anew in the next grandest demonstration of divinity that we can possibly imagine. And there are many, many things that we don't understand. But one of them is our, our right relationship with each other and our purpose for being here in life itself. Is, is there something about ourselves that we don't understand? Of course, we don't, yeah, and that's the third question of the, of the seven simple questions that would change the world overnight. Is it possible there's something we don't fully understand about who we are? The understanding of which would change our lives forever for the better. And the answer is, of course, of course there is. What we don't understand is that A, number one, that we are individuations of divinity. 
that we are aspects of God itself. And number two, what we don't understand is that we are not separate from each other. There's no separation. That we are all one. And I, I, know, I, I almost, I almost flinch from saying that because it sounds so hackneyed, so trite, so new agey. But in fact, it's true. And and it it it, it is in fact fundamentally uh, true that there's no separation between us any more than there's a separation between a drop of the ocean and the ocean itself. So when we understand our right relationship to each other, we would never put dollar value ahead of feeding a small child someplace in some corner of the world who gets a half a bowl of rice every week to try to subsist on and is dying. I mean, they're dying by the hundreds every hour for lack of food, just to use one example of, of the many cruelties that we sit back and we go, tsk, 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 you know, we're doing our best. We're, we're, do, we're not doing our best. We're not even doing close to our best. Look. If we can put a man on the moon, if we can dissect the human genome, we can find a way to stop humanity's cruelty to itself. It's absurd. I mean, guppies eat their young, but human beings shouldn't be doing that. So it's, it's, you know, it's such an obvious thing that one almost becomes incensed thinking about it. It's like, you know, hello, wake up. Right to the camera here. Hello, humanity, wake up. We are not guppies. We are not fish that eat their young. There ought to be a way to do this right. But, but you can't if, if it's about, you can't do it right if, if the economic system, bigger, better, more, bigger, better, more, bigger, better, more, drives the engine of the human experience. And that's a problem in itself. I mean, there's enough evidence out there to show that we're driving an unsustainable level of economic growth as it is. You know, the, the, the rate that we're using the Earth's resources would require at least 1.5 of our planets to keep going, even for a little bit longer. Let me tell you something, my friend. Before the next five years are out, 10 at the most, and probably more like three or five, we're going to have a food crisis on this planet. I mean, a major food crisis, not just a minor one. We're going to have a minor food crisis before this year is out probably before the next growing season because of the global warming and the problem that is created with droughts all across America and in the bread baskets of the Middle East and everywhere else that we can't grow enough food anymore. So you're going to find that only those with enough money, can, here we go again with the economic system, will be able to get food and those who are very, very poor are going to not be able to access food because it'll cause, and, and you know, whatever the traffic will bear, so prices will rise, prices will increase dramatically for a simple can of corn because they can't grow corn fast enough. We're going to have a water crisis on this planet before the next five years are out as well. We're going to have water wars if we're not careful, certainly water shortages, and I'm talking major water shortages, and energy shortages as well. So remember that I told you this, food, water, and energy are going to be major crisis points on this planet before the next five years are out, unless we wake up and change the way we're doing life on the Earth and have something else drive the engine of humanity's experience, something other than the economy. How about fundamental human values? Or for that matter, how about divine values? How about imagining that if we had the power to create our own reality, the power that God gave us to do so, how about if we use those values? It's incomprehensible to me what we're doing to ourselves on this planet. Mark Bunn from Sydney wants to know what your best recommendation is for the simplest way to know God in our everyday lives. Cause someone else to know God in their everyday life. Whatever you wish to experience for yourself, whatever it might be, be the cause of someone else experiencing it in their life. And Sitter Simons asks if the wisdom, if God's wisdom is innate, why do we resist it so much? If, if it's in, is what? innate within all of us, why do we resist so much? Because it's too good to be true. And because our culture is such that we have been rejecting the largest notions of our greatest wisdoms, you know, for centuries. George Bernard Shaw famously said, all great truth begins as blasphemy. And it takes centuries, centuries for us to go, oh, oh, I get it. You know, we probably should wash our hands before delivering babies. You know, you know it, took, it took 300 years for the medical profession to decide to do that. Uh, just to give you a, a, one striking example, and I got 100 of them. But, so we, we, 
tend to put more value and more faith in the uh, understandings and uh, awarenesses of our forefathers, of our ancestors, than we do in the callings of our own heart and our own soul. So, uh, because we think, well, they, they must know, you know, they must know, and they don't know. And the result is that the sins of the father are visited upon the sons, even unto the seventh generation. We keep on repeating the same mistakes over and over again, expecting to get a different result. That's the classic definition of insanity. But the reason that we don't give in to, surrender to our own inner wisdom, the wisdom of God that resides in all of us is, it's almost too good to be true. It, it's almost too simple, almost too easy. It, 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 we, we, can't, we can't imagine life could really be that way. But if we ever began to live our daily life from moment to moment, moving inside the wisdom of our soul, I've just finished a book, which will be out in a few months, called The Only Thing That Matters. And The Only Thing That Matters argues for the combining of the mind and the soul in the consideration of our daily choices and decisions. See, the mind holds nothing but experience which it imagines to be knowledge, knowledge, but experience is not knowledge, it's simply experience. And your experience can be warped by all manner of things. Knowledge, true knowledge is held in the soul. Eternal wisdom is held in the soul. So our job as human beings is to find a way to marry the mind's experience with the soul's knowledge and to come to a place in, in, in between. When a person does that, they're, they're said to have been centered. So you're really centered in that place between the mind and the soul. All great uh, mystics have found that place. They don't, they don't just reject the mind altogether because the mind's experience is valuable. If I didn't know about the mind's experience, I would, I would touch a hot pan on the stove and burn myself or, or put my hand in the socket and get a shock or walk off the edge of a cliff. So my experience, my mind is a, is a, is a good friend. I'm not saying we should reject our mind, but all the true mystics and masters have found a way to marry the mind of the soul rather than to live exclusively in the mind to the exclusion of the soul. If I, would, if I had one piece of advice for human beings, it would be connect with your soul. Find a way to connect with your soul every day. Not once a week when you go to church or synagogue or temple, but if you even do that, but every single day. How do you recommend people connect? Well, there's a thousand ways to do that. Meditation, guided imagery, visualization, ecstatic dance, whirling dervishes do it all the time. You know, reading good poetry, praying, you know, there's a thousand ways. But it starts with willingness. You must be willing. You must say, okay, God, or life, or whatever word you want to use that's comfortable to you. I'm here and I'm willing, I'm willing to be quiet for a moment each day with my soul. And if you do that often enough and regularly enough, Ultimately, you'll discover an opening, something happens. And it's not just a flash, but it, it, it occurs on a regular basis. Mystics know how to do that, and, and, and all the great masters have done that. So Katrina Kavanagh from Wollongong, she asks, in your book, you refer to a point that we are never meant to die. Can you tell us more about that? You're never meant to die. We were never meant to die. The, the, the life form that we call human being was designed to live forever. The only reason that we die is because, I mean, the only reason that our physicality ceases to exist in its present form is because of the environmental factors that we've created through the years that have made it virtually impossible for the, this magnificent physical specimen that we are to continue to exist in this present form. And the, the ways we've done that are multitudinous. Too, too many ways for us to describe. <laughs> the environment, the air we breathe, the food we eat, you know, what we think we need to do to, to stay alive. Uh, we imagine we have to, you know, well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> the things we imagine we have to do to survive are really what cause us to not survive. Like, you know, chowing down on a piece of steak three times a day, meat for breakfast, <laughs> meat for lunch, <laughs> meat for dinner, 
I'm a, I'm, I'm a meat eater. I'm a proud of it. I gotta eat meat to survive, but the, but, but the meat is killing you. Oh, I see. So what I have to do to survive, what I've taught myself I have to do to survive, is actually killing me. Okay, well, so be it. That's the way it goes, because I'm not giving up my meat or my cigarettes or my stuff, you know, and I'm not going to get, you know, so what? What are we doing? <laughs> And that's only one one hundredth of the things. You know, you've got three hours, I'll explain the rest. <laughs> Vanessa Dixon from Sydney asks, what kinds of conversations are you having with God these days? The latest conversation with God that I've had involves, as I mentioned, the only thing that matters. And what God said to me was, Neil, you got to help people understand what's really, really important. Interestingly enough, most people already know. When you tell people this, whether they're agnostics or atheists or whatever, it doesn't matter. Men, women, even children, they'll look at you and they start nodding their head. Yeah, I know that, I know that. Yeah, yeah, I know that too. I, yeah, I know, I really know what's really important. Then why don't you live that way? Good question. Mm. See, because this is what I thought was important before my own memory of what is really important was open to me. I thought life was about get the guy, get the girl, get the car, get the job, get the house, get the promotion, get the office in the corner, get the kids, get the grandkids. Get the sickness, get the gray hair, and get the hell out. And that's, that's life. It's just, you know, that's how it works. And then I realized that none of that mattered. None of that. That doesn't mean I, I won't do any of that. I may still have children and get a good job and all that, but not because that's what matters, but because that's simply the way that I express what matters. The only thing that really matters is who you imagine yourself to be and how you choose to place that into the world of your experience. If you imagine yourself to be an aspect of divinity, what does that look like to you? And, and how do you choose to place that in your life? Through your work, through your creativity, through the fact that you do in fact get up every day and pay the bills and take care of your family? Is that part of an aspect of divinity? Or do you want to just walk away from it all? You know, what, how, how do you do that? The concept of manifestation, I've talked to a number of people about that. Can I get your thoughts on manifestation? How people can manifest a life that they want, how they can create their life? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all else will be added unto you. You know, I'm not interested in teaching people how to manifest greater income, or the perfect mate, or the right house, or the, or, the, or the right and perfect job. That's sandbox metaphysics. It's for children. I saw a movie a few years ago, I happened to appear in it, called uh, The Secret. And in The Secret, I think it was made by an Australian, it may have been. It was yeah, I thought, Rhonda yeah, Rhonda Byrne, she's from Australia. So that explains everything. So, <laughs> uh -oh. so, Easy. Just having fun. Easy. Just having fun. <laughs> anyway, she, she could have easily have been an American, I promise you. <laughs> but, but the point is that, that that she was talking about the law of attraction and how to use it to attract things. And, she, and the movie was insisting that there's this great power that exists in all of us. We can create and attract anything we want. Just use the law of attraction. And then when it showed on the, on the, on the, on the screen, as examples of that, the guy walks out in front of his house and there's the car he's always wanted. A woman is sitting in her living room and suddenly an incredible diamond necklace appears on her bodice. Even a kid, eight-year-old kid, looks out in front of the, on the front door and a bicycle appears outside the front door. All these things, you know, a, a, will appear in your life just because you can use the law of attraction. And you know what, what my first thought was when I saw that movie? If we have such incredible power that we can attract everything and anything we want in our life, why wasn't there one minute, not one minute, in a nearly two-hour movie spent on how to create world peace? or end suffering, or, or, or put some kind of a halt to the incredible pain that millions of people on the planet are experiencing. How could anyone make a movie about the law of attraction and not spend 30 seconds talking about, let's use this enormous power we have to attract what really matters? And that said to me that, oh my God, even the new age, even the so-called enlightened new age, produces a movie about diamond necklaces on a bodice that appear suddenly and a new car in the driveway and not a single word about how to use this extraordinary power we're supposed to have 
to create a life that's better for all of us. It was the saddest thing I ever saw in my life. So I got to tell you that, you know, when our values are shifted, when somebody asks me, how can I manifest stuff in my life? I say to them, what do you want to manifest? A better you, more compassion, greater understanding, deeper wisdom, more love, or the perfect mate or the, the better job. No, no, no. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. When I shifted, and, and by the way, this is not the pot calling the kettle black. I did this. I made these same mistakes. I made these same choices. I even did my affirmations just seven times 70, you know, and I, all the ways that you can manifest your own reality. I did it for, for, for many years, 20, 30, 40 years, until finally God said, Neil, Neil, first of all, it's not about you. Your life isn't about you. It's about everyone else whose life you touch and the way you touch them. That's number one. Number two, even if you had all those things, do you think that's what's going to make you happy? You want to know how many people have the perfect car, the perfect mate, the perfect job, and they're sad as hell? Hello, wake up. Hello, earth to Neil, earth to Neil. And I finally got it, that if I spent my life sharing the wisdom, the understanding, the clarity, and the love of God with as many people as I could reach. I would no longer have to search for the perfect mate, the perfect job, the perfect income, the perfect anything. It would all just crash in on me, and guess what? Hello? <laughs> you know, I mean, but even if it didn't, even if it didn't, it, it wouldn't matter. You don't find very many unhappy people who are spending their lives sharing compassion, patience, understanding, wisdom, and love with all those whose lives they touch. They're not worried about when their next hair appointment is, or what model and make the car in the driveway is, or how much their money they're making every week. Every, do you think the Dalai Lama cares about that? Do you think that Thich Nhat Hanh is worried about it? I, I don't think so. Friends, folks, humans everywhere you got to hear me man we got to shift our values shift our understanding change our raison d'etre our reason for being it has nothing to do with any of this i promise you thank you thank you so much <laughs>